Well, hello and welcome to a very special American Nuclear Society event called Revol Revolutionizing the Future of Space Flight and Habitation. I'm Craig Piercy, and I'm the Executive Director and CEO of the American Nuclear Society, and I'll be serving as the moderator for this panel session. So for decades, humanity has dreamed about venturing into the vastness of space. The story of humanity's exploration of the next frontier beyond our atmosphere has had many triumphs as well as a few failures. And now we move into a new age of exploration and growth beyond our planet. And we aim to build on those past successes and push past our current limits. Nuclear energy is a necessary, a necessary enabler to long distance, long duration space travel. Whether we're talking mission or mission energy, nuclear technology is playing a large role in the planning for future space missions. Frankly, we simply aren't going to get to where we want to go without it. Today, I'm excited to be joined by representatives from DARPA, DOD, and NASA to discuss how nuclear energy fits into America's current space ambitions, as well as where we might be going next. Before we get started with the conversation, I'd like to cover a couple of quick notes regarding today's events. If you have any questions, please type them into the Q&A function. I will attempt to address as many questions as possible in the time we have allotted. The event will be recorded and a link to the recording will be emailed to event registrants later today. Additionally, certificates of attendance for the event are available by request. Please see the chat for contact information. And finally, we ask that all participants adhere to the ANS Code of Ethics and Respectful Behavior Policy, which can be found at ans.org. So with those notes out of the way, I'd like to introduce today's panelists. Dr. Tabitha Dotson is the Program Manager for the Demonstration Rocket for Agile Cislunar Operations, or DRACO, as it's commonly known at DARPA, where she's worked since 2018 for the creation of that program. She has a PhD in both mechanical and aerospace engineering and a PhD in applied physics with both degrees being focused in nuclear materials and engineering and nuclear physics. Dr. Anthony Calamino is a materials and structures research engineer with the Langley, with NASA Langley Research Center and has worked for NASA since 1985. He currently serves as the NASA materials technical lead for the entry systems modeling projects and the deputy principal investigator for flexible systems development under NASA's hypersonic inflatable aerodynamic decelerator programs. And finally, last but not least, Lieutenant Colonel Tommy Nix, who serves as space nuclear power lead and senior military advisor in the United States Space Force. As senior military advisor, he provides leadership and direction for over 120 personnel conducting world-class research across multiple portfolios to advance spacecraft technologies. As Space Nuclear Power Lead, he provides oversight for a program advancing multiple technical areas, including heat dissipation, power conversion, and nuclear power systems. So for additional information uh, on today's speakers, please see the link in the chat but I'm going to introduce our panelists one by one for some opening remarks. And Tabitha, I'd like to start with you. So uh, turn on your camera. Let's see what background you have and uh, uh, please give your opening remarks. There you are. Off mute. Thank you, Craig. So thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me to come onto your webinar and talk about the, in my opinion, the, the coolest thing on the planet, um, nuclear thermal propulsion in the Draco program, which um, uh, is the, the program that I'm um, currently running here over at, at DARPA. Um, and so just, just as Craig said in his opening remarks, most of space is a vast and inhospitable void. And just like the ocean, it takes gigantic amounts of time or energy you can get from one landing port so and human beings on top of that when when you're in space or in the ocean need an enormous amounts of power for lack 
life support and ideally powerful propulsion systems to get through the void quick, quickly in order to survive. And I'm I'm assuming I'm speaking, uh, preaching to the choir here, if, if most of the audience here is nuclear friendly, that we all know um, in our hearts and minds that nothing can exceed that per performance in power and propulsion um, than proven nuclear technologies. So sp specifically, um, uh, uh, representing uh, Draco, I'm here to highlight nuclear thermal propulsion in, in this webinar. So uh, a nuclear thermal rocket has been proven through ground testing and past programs to have enhanced performance over existing in-space propulsion technologies. So the past programs on the ground brought nuclear thermal rockets to a state of flight readiness, which is one of the reasons why we're moving forward with the Draco program straight to an in-space flight demonstration. Uh, the nuclear thermal um, rocket could also be used for dual mode electrical power. Um, granted, it has uh, that nuclear reactor, um, which is typically used on the on the earth for, for nuclear power applications. So um, a lot of people may be unaware of this remarkable uh, versatility of this reactor. So I think it's important to point that out. It's, it's something that we uh, don't commonly talk about. Um, the Draco program though, is focused on demonstrating the propulsion capability of the nuclear rocket this time. Um, so we're using high assay, low enriched uranium or halo fuel data on the novel use of halo versus uh, highly enriched uranium, which is what was historically used. So after the Draco flight demonstration is complete, our transition partners on uh, and space force will have a wealth of data that will help them inform their follow-ups for uh, how they would like to make their nuclear space reactors, um, those kinds of reactors. Um, and the NTR could be evolved again in the future to demonstrate its dual mode power and propulsion capabilities. Um, so for, for this discussion, I look forward to um, uh, answering questions and uh, representing the uh, uh, Draco. Well, thank you, Tabitha. Uh, so uh, Anthony, I'm gonna turn it over to you. I can see you and I think you're still on mute. Right, there we are. There we go, you're on. It kept, yeah, I had a difficult time finding the button. Uh, good afternoon and thank you for inviting me onto the panel. Uh, apparently I sent you um, a bio that is a little dated, I apologize for that. But just to bring the audience up to speed, uh, I am currently actually at, at at NASA headquarters, I work out of the uh, space technology maturation, or sorry, space technology mission directorate. Our uh, mission uh, objectives are to advance uh, innovative te technologies and capabilities that NASA sees as enabling for our future missions. Uh, and so my area of expertise has been in high temperature materials, and I have worked in the nuclear technology area now for pretty close to seven years, maybe a little longer than seven years. And uh, you pick up quite a bit of information and knowledge just working with that community and, and understanding what the challenges are. And, uh, and and I really am honored to be able to bring some of my knowledge and materials to, to help out with this problem. Uh, it's in terms of looking at what NASA's uh, focusing on in the in the nuclear technology area, I think you know it's worthwhile to point out or highlight what was said before the vastness of space. I, I really want to also uh, emphasize the, the inhospitality of inhospitality of, of to human uh, life outside of the Earth. You know, there are some basic things even on Earth that we've looked at and we recognize that we need as we begin to explore a new area or a new frontier. You know, I've, I've always talked about those as being divided into three technology or three capability areas, which is transportation or transportation infrastructure, a communications infrastructure, being able to actually talk back and forth. Uh, and then the other one is a, a power infrastructure uh, to, to be able to provide energy to survive, to utilize the resources that you find in a location, to produce the resources and uh, items that you need to actually survive uh, and eventually thrive in a new uh, region or area. When we look at 
nuclear technology, uh, nuclear technology actually fits very well into two of those three infrastructure needs. Uh, it, is a, it is a capability that can provide us with a transportation system. And it is also a capability that we're looking at for a power system. And as Tabitha mentioned, uh, you know, the propulsion and the power can be combined uh, for a dual mode or a dual capable NTP system. Our goal in, in working this, obviously NASA is looking at uh, exploration for the benefits of science and, and, and getting a better answer to some of our scientific questions of how things have emerged, how planets evolved, how life has evolved. A lot of the science missions can benefit directly from uh, higher power energy systems for science missions. A lot of those science missions, particularly those that go to deep space locations, are currently powered by what we refer to as radioisotope systems, RPS systems. They have powered many or, or basically all of the missions that we've had on Mars. Uh, they've powered Voyager, the Voyager missions, a lot of the other missions to Jupiter. Uh, they generally produce relatively low levels of power watts. Uh, as we begin to look at having a human presence in space, uh, we're going to have power needs that are going to be in the kilowatts to megawatts eventually kind of regions to, to do the things we want. These legacy RPS systems are uh, not the solution. And fission systems now become the next sort of capability that makes sense from us in terms of mass and volume in, in operation. The other nice thing about looking at these systems is that they offer a high degree of Earth independence. You know, the nuclear reactor is a physics-based system. It is going to turn off and on. I uh, think of it as, as almost a self-contained autonomous system. It doesn't need oxygen. It doesn't need a fuel like methane to turn off and on. It literally will be able to produce power by rotating control rods. And, and that has a big benefit to us because that thermal energy now can be converted to other forms of energy to conduct operations either on the surface of the moon, which is one of the first uh, objectives on this, but also transportation to and even operations on the surface of, of Mars. And in looking at the way that we can optimize these systems in terms of mass and volume, we can make them potentially more reliable, uh, higher power, and smaller and lighter than what we would be able to do with conventional chemical or solar systems. And so these, we are looking at these as, as really game changers for a lot of our exploration missions that we're looking to uh, conduct in the, in the next 20, 20 year horizon. Thanks, Anthony. Um, we'll, we'll get to questions in a second, but I've already got a few. Uh, but All right. before we do that, I want, to, uh, I want to go to Lieutenant Colonel Nix, Tommy. Hello. We can see you and hear you. Okay. Uh, thanks everyone for uh, coming to the, and inviting me onto the panel today. Um, overall, um, at the Air Force Research Lab, we look at looking at new technologies to help the warfighter across uh, across the board, mostly for the Space Force inside of the um, Space Vehicles Directorate. But obviously, as we're prevent pursuing new technologies that are going to have um, applications across the joint enterprise at, of the Department of Defense. But um, nuclear as a whole, as we move farther and farther out from what our current mission set is, we'll need higher power at, um, to cover the bigger volumes. And so that's where a lot of the focus on our programs are. And so um, while there is some propulsion and um, there are things that we're looking at to doing uh, with Draco later on, like Tabitha said, um, our focus right now is on nuclear electric pr production and then pr uh, applying those to newer pay new payloads and then also being able to operate in sun agnostic manners and new architectures that we're um, currently planning and looking at uh, providing a force presence across the um, new parts of space as we expand outside of the geo belt. But so um, for my program, so I have two major programs. I have the Jetson effort, which is the joint emergent technology supplying on orbit nuclear power. Um, 
there, there are two tracks in that. There's a high power, there's a fission side of that where we're looking at a fission reactor and then all the different subsystems that support that fission reactor. So, you know, the heat dissipation, the, the heat management, also the power conversion side of that, and then electric propulsion, um, the deployable structures that will support a system like that because you can't fit it inside of a, of a launch vehicle and then put it up and needs to expand to get the radiators and things like that out. And then also the radiation shielding and then those effects on that the electronics that are inside that system since we won't have the ability to space it across um, a larger um, distance. On the low power side, um, like Anthony was saying, we're looking at RPSs, but um, where NASA focuses on plutonium, and there are there are some efforts to go to different um, materials. We're looking at different isotopes on our end, so that way we're not competing with them for that strategic reserve of plutonium that we have inside the country. Um, so americium or cobalt sixty, um, strontium ninety. Those are those are the efforts that Jetson is looking at on the low power side, and that side of it is going to be a very small system um, to do um, navigation beacon work that we're currently planning. Um, the other effort that I have is called Lens. It's a low profile electric nuclear satellite, so it's using strontium ninety um, byproduct of um, plutonium generation currently, and then uh, pelletizing that and creating a power source. Um, for a low observable um, spacecraft in um, LEO orbit. Thanks, Tommy. Um, so let me invite all of our guests to turn on the uh, uh, to turn on their cameras and and let's sort of begin with a few few more general questions. Um, and I'm gonna I'm gonna throw this one. Uh, this question out to uh, Anthony first, but it seems like for each of the three of you, you you've come to nuclear from different disciplines and, and different use cases. You're not coming up through the industry, right? So, but when you look at it, obviously there's a fairly well-developed terrestrial nuclear industry that is, you know, currently looking at advanced technologies, but and I would imagine that some of those technologies have applications into the space environment. But you know, t talk to me a little bit about how those those reactors need to look different in space. Like, how what are the mission parameters in space that force you to look at different design considerations, fuel considerations, and so forth? Anthony, you want to start, and anybody else can jump in. Sure, I I, I can start, um, and I I, I think maybe a little bit on the you know different background than nuclear or nuclear engineering background uh you know my background is in in high temperature materials and engineering mechanics you know my experience has been throughout my career at nasa is looking at how do i make you know our our, our saying is is that you know airplanes aren't built out of air and that's why materials exist you know you've got to have something to build this capability Materials are the things that we reach out to get it done. Uh, the higher temperature, the more challenging this becomes. Nuclear energy becomes a nuclear reactor becomes an even more challenging thing. And and so the, having that sort of multidisciplinary viewpoint or background really becomes an advantage when you step into and then you start to gain the knowledge of, of, of the engineering, the nuclear engineering aspects. The uh, Looking at, at what's the challenges in terms of the capabilities, I you know I'll leave some of this open for Tab. I think she could speak a lot with the NTP technologies. They have some very unique ones in and of themselves. I, I think it would be good to hear from her on in terms of looking at them as aerospace systems. Uh, you know, it's we want to be able to use as much technology or leverage as much technology as we can from terrestrial systems. We don't want to invent the wheel. If we don't need to invent the wheel and we can reach out and we can use some of the tools and knowledge that that we've developed with terrestrial systems one of the things about terrestrial systems is they don't care how heavy they are they don't care how big they are you know it's it's going to be supported by earth and so it can be as heavy and as big as it needs to be and a lot of that sometimes is driven by safety measures uh defense and depth measures uh, other aspects that 
really become more economic driven uh, for terrestrial systems than they do for aerospace systems. For aerospace systems, we have to fly them. They need to leave the earth. That means they need to be light. They need to be small. We need to get them off, off of the earth and we need to be able to use them and land them on a terrestrial body such as the lunar surface or, or Mars. And, and that really, when you look at a nuclear system, becomes a big driver because you want to have that activity, um, the, the nuclear activity that gives you that energy. And there's a certain amount of what we call fuel meat that you need to maintain that reaction inside that reactor core. And that drives the size of the, the reactor, depending on how many neutrons you need. You can either scale that up by, by taking in more fissionable material that makes it more heavy, or you can actually add things that we call moderators. You can take advantage of some of the neutrons that are produced in the fissioning events that would not normally participate in a fission event or don't have the probability of participating in a fission event that some of the other uh, neutrons do. And you can actually uh, enhance their ability to, to interact with the uranium-235 atom and produce another fissioning event. And I'm sure your audience knows these as, as moderators. You know, graphite's a moderator. Beryllium can act as a moderator. We're looking at, at metal hydrides as a moderator because they're much more effective. They're lighter weight uh, for, for what we're doing. The overall mass weight uh, is driven down. But we need to mature these moderators. We need to understand these moderators better in, in the environments that we're going to use them in because we want to operate these plants 250,000 miles away from Earth autonomously and we never want to actually go in there and maintain them after 10 years they want them to operate